My mother shared the story about Hannah praying in the temple with me. Much earlier in my life than most kids get that story. You see, she had taken it to be her story as well. And she tells the story of how she and my father were having difficulty conceiving, how she had prayed and prayed and told God, if you'll let me have a child, I will let you have that child. And here I am. <laughs> and my brother, too, serving the church. For my mother, the story of Hannah was a story of promise, not just in ancient times, but for herself. And she prayed, and she prayed. And eventually those prayers were fruit. For Hannah, well, Hannah didn't have that example in front of her. Hannah was cutting new territory, as it were, going up to the temple with her husband, Elkanah, offering her sacrifices and praying for a child. Of course, for Hannah, it was a little bit more complicated since Elkanah, following the biblical model of marriage, had two wives. That was a laugh line. <laughs> but Elkanah had two wives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But that other wife was the one who had had the children, was the one who, in her culture, had given her husband what she was supposed to do. And Hannah felt like a failure. And to make it worse, that other wife kept rubbing her nose in it, taunting her about being unable to perform the way she should. Can you imagine living in that household? I know I can. But Alcana took care of his wife because he loved her. And every time they would go to the temple and he would give them their offerings to, to make to God, he would give Hannah a double portion, hoping that in that double offering, God would hear her prayer. The fact that she prayed, the fact that her husband supported her, the fact that she poured out her heart to God, though, wasn't enough. And Eli, there in the temple, saw her praying with her lips moving and no sound coming out. And he did what so many religious people over the years have done. He judged her. He told her, lay your nets. That, that's a paraphrase, but that's basically what he told her. He said, put away the wine. You don't come here to just be a fool. But she called him back to account. Sir, I'm here praying. I'm not drunk. But my heart is so full of prayer that I can't find a speech for it. And Eli knew then that there was something special taking place in this woman's prayer. And he blessed her. May God hear your prayer and grant what you've asked. And before long, Hannah became a mother to Samuel. So that's our first scripture text this morning. Then there's the second one. Jesus and his disciples are in that same temple centuries later. And like tourists making their first trip in Manhattan, 
The disciples are just looking up. Gee, what big stones, they say. And Jesus then launches into this explanation how not one stone will be left on another, how there will be death and destruction, how there will be earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars. And we read this and we think, oh my gosh. Especially this week, don't we? We hear of nation rising up against nation. We hear of violence between people. And we don't know what to do with it. Especially when we see this part of scripture that we usually gloss right over in Mark's gospel. But let me do just a little bit of historical education. I think it may help put things in context. For Jesus was speaking to his followers about things to come, about the destruction of the temple that happened in the year 70, when the Romans came through and destroyed it and all of Jerusalem, when the Jewish diaspora took place. And he speaks of all of these coming events using the symbolic imagery that is so prevalent in the Hebrew scriptures, what's called apocalyptic literature. Now, when Mark wrote this, he of course had the historical advantage of writing not at the time that Jesus was speaking, but writing after it had already happened. And so Mark is able to flesh out a bit of what Jesus might have said that day, talking about nation rising up against nation when the Romans would one day come to town. But you know, there are Christians who have taken these chunks of apocalyptic literature and hung their faith on them, reading them not as metaphor, not as history, but as prophecy for the future. Of course, one of those groups were the Branch Davidians, who in their compound in Waco, Texas, so long ago, were looking to David Koresh as the Messiah, as the one who would bring about this end time, who would bring to fruition God's prophecy of a new day. We see the same thing within Islam. Not that Islam holds out that end times apocalyptic vision, but that there are people just like the Branch Davidians within Islam who do. And that's what we have seen in recent days, with the attack in Paris being just the most recent example. We forget or maybe we're blind to the 43 people and more than 200 who were wounded in coordinated bombings in Beirut on Thursday by the same ISIS operatives. We forget the 224 people killed on an airline from Sharm el Sheikh. We forget the thousands in Iraq and Syria, and Nigeria, and Pakistan, and Kenya, who have been killed by this same movement in recent months. We've all turned our Facebook profile pictures into the French flag. Well, maybe not all of us. But if we only look at Friday's attack, we miss the point. Because we start seeing an attack of Muslims against Christians. And that's not what's taking place. My response on Friday evening, I wrote, as Paris 
in the world mourn the horrific violence that has unfolded today, we must remember not to lash out in our anger and fear. Already I have seen Muslims and Islam vilified rather than ISIS. Already I have seen Syrian refugees blamed for today's act of terrorism rather than acknowledging them as victims of exactly this kind of violence who have had to flee for their own safety. Already I have read numerous posts that urge wholesale violence against Muslims, that urge building walls, that suggest that a gun-toting populace could have stopped terrorists armed with automatic weapons and grenades. Already I have seen too much. Violence begets violence. Hatred begets hatred. Fear begets fear. Ignorance begets ignorance. As we stand in solidarity with our French sisters and brothers, let us renew our commitment to liberté, égalité, and fraternité, not only for those who share our religion or culture, but for all people. Let us carry on the legacy of those slain in the city of lights by working against the powers of darkness, by working for peace, and by letting our light shine. As is so often the case, the words that we throw out into the ether come back to us from other sources, and I've been watching people as they posted and reposted and reposted what I had written. But I have to admit that I'm glad that I'm not the only one out there speaking. Anne Lamont, one of my favorite spiritual writers, wrote about how we can cope with tragedies like the terrorist attacks in Paris and Beirut. And she wrote, so after an appropriate time of being stunned, in despair, we show up. Maybe we ask God for help. We do the next thing. We buy or cook a bunch of food for the local homeless. We return phone calls, library books, smiles. We make eye contact with others, and we go to the market and flirt with older, scary, unusual people who seem lonely. <laughs> this is a blessed sacrament. Tom Weston taught me decades ago that in the face of human tragedy, we go around the neighborhood and pick up litter, even though there will be more tomorrow. It is another blessed sacrament. We take the action, and the insight will follow. That we are basically powerless, but we are not helpless. <coughs> Hannah's offering, Hannah's prayer, wasn't a one-time event. Year after year, she made her offerings in the temple. She prayed to God for a child. Day after day, she asked God for a baby. She didn't give up. She didn't let the taunting of Alcana's other wife beat her down. <laughs> Instead, she held firm to her desire, and she held firm to her faith. She stood up to the priest who thought she was drunk, and finally she became the mother that she'd always wanted to be. But you know, the story didn't end there. Because Hannah had made a promise to God that she would raise her son as a Nazarite, as one who was living under a religious vow that meant that he would live in the temple, that he would never cut his hair, that he would never taste alcohol, that he would never have relations with a woman. And so even as 
Hannah made that promise for her son, she was giving up the promise of grandchildren. But you know, Samuel, that son of hers, did more than give her grandkids. Samuel grew to be the prophet. The one who went out and visited Jesse one day and told him, let me see your sons, because I'm going to anoint one of them as king. Samuel was the one who had the vision to pass over all the big, strong sons who looked very regal in their bearing and could see in little David, the puny shepherd boy, God's chosen one. Samuel was the one who would anoint him king long before Saul's reign was over, selecting him as God's anointed one to lead the people. And as Christians, we see that line from David down to the generations to Jesus. All from Hannah's boy, that prophet. The one that she gave to God and God gave the insight to be able to choose and to help build God's people. So today we come together as God's people, looking at the events in the world around us and seeing a world that is broken, and we pray, just like Hannah did. We don't just pray today, we don't just pray this week, but we pray every day, asking God to help remake the world, asking God to help us remake the world in ways that build justice, that establish peace and security. We offer ourselves and our children and maybe even our grandchildren as servants of God. And we ask for God's vision as each one of us looks to the future and even speaks a prophetic word from time to time. May God then be with us today and always. Amen.